page 58. The ART and Science of Low-Carbohydrate Living, an expert guide to making the life-saving benefits of carbohydrate restriction sustainable and enjoyable. By Jeff S. Volek, Ph.D., Rode and Stephen D. Finney, M.D., Ph.D. Section 2 Perspective Chapter 2 Low Carbohydrate Lessons from Aboriginal Cultures 2.4. Which came first? Oilage in grease or olive oil. In a recent conversation with Bill Moore, a local fisherman of the Niska Band in Greenville, Laxgoltzap, British Columbia, one of us suggested that oilage in grease is like olive oil from the sea. Bill thought for a moment and then responded, We have been harvesting the oilage in for 9,000 years which is a lot longer than people have grown olives so maybe we should think of olive oil as oilage and grease from the land. But there's another reason why oilage and grease was wildly popular in the pre-contact Pacific Northwest. Again, this can be explained in part by simple chemistry. The human body stores fat for reserve energy to sustain itself if there is nothing else to eat and our bodies seem to favor the storage of monounsaturates over other classes of fatty acids. Monounsaturates, along with saturates, appear to be what our cells want to burn when they are adapted to burning mostly fat. Oilage in grease is rich in monounsaturates, and thus is more like human fat than anything else in the region. Thus oilage in grease appears to have an ideal fat composition for humans who consume a diet appropriately rich in fat. Somehow, without the benefit of modern chemistry or nutritionists to tell them what to do, a diverse collection of peoples inhabiting 3,000 miles of the Pacific coastline of North America discovered this, and built their cultures and a regional trade economy around this one source of fat. 2.5 Salt. Whole books have been written about the history of salt. Wars were fought over access to salt. Roman soldiers were often paid with a measure of salt, hence the origin of the English word a salary. Hunters and their prey, herders and their cattle, all shaped their actions and habits around access to salt. The reason, of course, is that salt, sodium, is necessary for life. Humans did not need to know chemistry to understand the value of salt. Salt deprivation leads to lightheadedness, fatigue, headache, and malaise. Aboriginal cultures could figure out that if they drank from one spring, they began to feel lousy, but if they drank from that other one, they'd feel okay. The Inuit knew which ice to melt for water to boil their meat. Sea ice loses its salt content with age. Fresh ice had too much salt, fresh snow had none, whereas older sea ice was just right. Inland hunters followed their prey to salt licks and salt springs. These waters were prized for cooking, and some cultures learned to dry these waters to make dry salt. But the universal dependable source of salt for inland hunters and herders alike was blood. Blood was collected from freshly killed animals using the emptied stomach as a container, whether from a bison on the Great Plains or from caribou or muskox on the tundra. A liter of whole blood contains about 2 grams of sodium, so 500 milliliters per day would ward off acute symptoms of salt depletion. Among the Maasai living in hot inland Kenya, the consumption of blood was a staple of their culture, along with meat and milk. Even in the 1920s, long after British trade had provided them access to dry salt, the Maasai still bled their cattle to provide each hunter with a token 50 milliliters of blood per day 6. Given another century of perspective, perhaps the pejorative phrase misrepresenting many Aboriginal cultures as a bloodthirsty savages might better be replaced by the phrase a bloodthirsty savants. Today we I know that too much salt is bad for us, so why this long discussion of a discredited nutrient? 
The short answer is that the amount of carbohydrate in our diet changes our need for salt. High carbohydrate diets make the kidneys retain salt, whereas a low carbohydrate intake increases sodium excretion by the kidney, called adenitriuresis of fasting. Hunting cultures seem to understand this, and thus their highly evolved practices of finding sodium and consuming enough of it to maintain health and well being. 2.6 Summary The last few decades have yielded a lot of scientific knowledge about low carbohydrate diets, but in the few thousand millennia preceding the development of modern science, our hunting and herding ancestors solved the practical problems needed to live and function well with a minimal carbohydrate intake. They didn't need to know how it worked, just that it did. Successful dietary practices were integrated into their cultures and passed along across generations. But as these traditional cultures were overwhelmed and replaced by agriculture, much of this hard-won knowledge has been lost. This is unfortunate, given the potential value that low-carbohydrate diets offer us, particularly in the management of diseases associated with insulin resistance. So let us summarize three lessons plucked from a few of these cultures. 1. First, a well-formulated low-carbohydrate diet is moderate in protein and higher in fat. People attempting to follow a low-carbohydrate diet that is also low in fat will find it unpleasant if not unhealthy and difficult to sustain. Aboriginal cultures knew that the body prefers fat over protein as fuel. 2. Second, the type of fat eaten when most of your energy comes from fat is important. If you are a hunter getting 70 to 80 percent of your energy from fat, your dietary fat composition needs to be different from what you would consume if you were a subsistence farmer eating mostly carbohydrates with just 15 percent of your energy as fat. When fat is used for fuel, the body prefers that a majority of it be provided as monounsaturates and saturates. On a low-carbohydrate diet appropriately rich in fat, even if only a small proportion of your fat is polyunsaturated, this small fraction times the total amount will still provide enough grams of the essential fatty acids. Because they function like vitamins rather than fuel, for the essential fatty acids, it's all about dose, not percent. And for the omega-6 fats in particular, more is not necessarily better. See Chapter 9, Effects of Carbohydrate Restriction on Fatty Acid Metabolism. 3. Third, the body's metabolism of salt is uniquely different when one is adapted to a low-carbohydrate diet. Salt and water are more efficiently excreted which is a good thing as long as you maintain an adequate minimum sodium intake. Ignore this lesson and you are likely to suffer the completely avoidable problems of headache, fatigue, weakness, and constipation a maladies that any Inuit healer would have promptly resolved by giving you a bowl of blood soup, or meat broth made with sea ice of the proper age. Page 63